anymore. Because as somebody who does have a heart issue and whose dad died at age 45 of a sudden heart attack, I'm very tuned into heart health. And I have three kids, yes. including two boys. And so I don't appreciate when people try to shame doctors like you out of asking questions because there are invariably people like me all over the place, millions of us, who would like to also know those answers and don't want people like you who have a public micro microphone and the education to ask smart questions about these matters from being silenced out of asking them. Thank you. I, I agree. I, I felt like I was uh, running the French underground here that was trying to just make sense of things <laughs> and broadcast quietly to the to the enlightened. And it, it's gotten the same and it's maybe a little worse right now. I mean, this unfortunate thing that happened at the NFL yesterday, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, f triggered everybody. It triggered everybody. It's it's very bizarre. And, and when physicians get together, I was just on a Twitter spaces where a bunch of doctors were together. And we, we really uh, only disagreed on one point, and really it was just one point, and it, and it needs to be answered. Should we be concerned about the risk, the myocardial, the all cardiac cause risk to young males from the Moderna vaccine? Should we be worried about that, yes or no? And if we are worried about it, what is that relative risk of the vaccine versus COVID itself? Just somebody please answer that question. And, and these, mm -hmm. I was talking with one doctor, he said, I think you're going to be very much more at risk from COVID. And I said, you, you may be right. I actually don't have an opinion. I just want the answer. I don't care who's right, but somebody's going to be right and somebody's going to be wrong. And until we get that answer, uh, we can't know who that is or what we should be doing. Again, we can't even render informed consent to patients. And in California, we risk our license if we bring the whole topic up. Can I Crazy. tell you, it's not just the licensure boards, it's the news media too. Like I, I will tell you that um, I happen to know that ABC News spiked a big story they were working on, on young cardiac deaths in relatively young teenagers, like 17, 18 year olds. Mm. They were preparing a report and suddenly it got pulled. Why? Why would you pull a report like that? Like in the wake of COVID, Terrible. in the wake of vaccines. And I'll bet you dollars to donuts is because it was leading down a road that would have looked like they were questioning the safety of vaccines or heart health yep. in the wake of the pandemic. Either one, they felt uncomfortable yep. and they they pulled it, right? So it's like, this happens all the time, right? There is, if, you're, if you're going anywhere near one of the sacred cows, you better be really effing careful because you're going to get not just Twitter blowback. Forget that. That's a one day thing. You're going to get uh, potentially canceled. You could get fired. You could get, lose your license. Like it can get absolutely devastating, which is how they're chilling free speech across the board. It's not just the Twitter files and Fauci and the White House coordinating with Twitter to suppress views of Dr. Martin Kulldorff of Harvard on Harvard on vaccines and so on. It goes way beyond that. And everybody who's paying mm -hmm. attention at this point knows it. They either care or they don't care. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. You mentioned earlier how the, uh, the, some of the regulatory officials have changed their tune. Uh, I want to read you a tweet. Uh, when did this come out on New Year's Eve or the day New Year's Eve, Eve, I think it was. Yeah. 1230 from Rochelle Walensky, the director of the CDC. Mm. Here's her opening statement. We can't stop the spread of COVID-19. <laughs> what? You just shut you just shut the world down insisting that zero COVID safety Uber Alice was the only option and you were willing to destroy millions of lives to do it and now just coyly open a tweet with we can't stop the spread of COVID-19 which is true. That's true. You can't Well, I'm very pleased to welcome back Ivor Cummins to our program. We're going to finish our conversation that got interrupted by a thunderstorm in Alabama that took out Caleb's entire system without our knowing it. Right in the middle, just as I was asking, you, we are talking about horrible things. You keep a smile on your face. How is that possible? So we're going to start back there, generally speaking. We're also going to get George... Gammon in here, uh, establishment elites are simply following a playbook to dismantle the Constitution. Interesting. Corporate media condemning the Constitution. We have sort of article after article. The First Amendment is out of control. Elections are banned for democracy. This is the New York Times. You can follow George at, at George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. And of course, Avor Cummins at, at Fat Emperor. Uh, we will be back with both gentlemen in just a second. We're going to start with Ivor Cummins.
Our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Joint and muscle pains are exhausting and frustrating, but I've got a over-the-counter medication I want to introduce you to that provides great relief using the power of, check it out, chili peppers. Capsidin is made with a proprietary formula that contains no non anti-inflammatory agents, no opioids, no anesthetic or steroid, nothing, no chance for addiction, no side effects. No chance it's going to interact with other medication you might be taking. Capsidin contains capsaicin, which is the substance in chili peppers that burns your tongue. It's that gives you that burny feeling. And of course, I've recommended capsaicin creams to patients over the years, but other capsaicin creams burn your skin. That's what makes capsidin so unique. In clinical trials, capsidin has actually been demonstrated not to burn. I've been using capsidin to relieve my pain in my hands and my wrist from carpal tunnel syndrome and arthritis. The results have been amazing. I use it every day during my show. And I highly recommend it. Get the pain relief you need from various sources, even backaches, sprains, bruises even. Order now at capsidin.com slash Drew to get a 15% discount plus free shipping. That is C-A-P-S-A-D-Y-N, capsidin.com slash D-R-E-W. So as I said, George Gamble will join us in just a minute. Some of his particular, he's an entrepreneur, real estate investor, host of Rebel Capitalist Show, 500,000 YouTube subscribers, macroeconomics, liberty, wealth building, really interesting stuff, YouTube slash George Gammon. Uh, and also uh, on X, it is at George Gammon, G-A-M-M-O-N. But first, I just want to finish my conversation with Ivor Cummins. Ivor is a biochemical engineer, author of Eat Rich, Live Long. 25 years in corporate technical leadership and management positions, uh, and he has been researching root causes of chronic disease. Ivor, thank you for coming back in spite of being on Dublin time. You, you, I appreciate it. I know it's not early there. Oh, no, it's great to be back, Dr. Drew, and finish our conversation. <laughs> So uh, is it, uh, so as we ended our conversation, I was going to a, a break and I was like, wow, you have such a great attitude about some of the, well, now you vanished. Oh, there you are. Such a great attitude oh, about power. some of these horrible things we were, we were discussing. Uh, and uh, is it Amor Fati or is it gumption? Ah, it's a mixture of both, uh, Dr. Drew. So Amor Fati, very important just to explain, love of fate. So you have to love fate. You have to accept fate, what is going to happen. And that doesn't mean that you sit back and do nothing. You strive to change the future. But if the future happens, if we all end up in the gulag, sharing a last cigarette, so be it. Once we tried, and there's a couple of amazing tools in stoicism to help with that. One of them is negative visualization. Now, you got to be careful with this one. Uh, you got to be aware of the method. So what you do is you visualize in kind of meditation the worst possible outcome in things you might fear. I mean, pretty serious stuff. Death of a loved one, uh, disaster in your work world, stuff like that. And you go there and you visualize it and you kind of feel it. And then you accept it if it indeed happens. And then you come back to the present. You stride, strive to avoid it, but you've already accepted it. I'll give you a quick example uh, from surveys of sickness, as George would call it, to escape YouTube censorship. We can't say the C word. But basically, in the summer of 2020, I was fighting really hard. I was making good ground, sharing the science on Cerveza. And then I had a black period, a very dark few days, because I had told all the doctors in my Irish medical group uh, who are fighting against the madness, I had said, according to Art of War, we own the terrain. We know it's seasonal. The hospitals are empty now in June, and they have nothing no fear porn until next October. 
So we own the terrain for four months. We got to work really hard and double down. And then they pulled a master stroke. In fairness, they began to bring in mandatory masks with prison sentences and fines. Now, we never found out, but it came from the very top. So while the hospitals were empty and everyone was moving on and they would find it hard to bring people back to the nonsense, they did a master stroke. They put everyone in masks and it worked and it kept a feeling of pandemia alive. And in those few days, I said, oh my God, uh, you know, it was a bit depressing because I thought we've lost our four months of terrain. So what I did was I projected forward a year. I knew this was all about uh, obviously the mRNA technology and the QR codes. And I said, okay, I projected to summer 21 on my deck. And I said, they achieved the passports. They achieved the coercion. Near everybody takes it. And a minority are pariahs. And they basically get what they want. And I visualized it and I accepted it. And then I came back to my deck in 2020, June, back a year to where I was. And I said, okay, now I'm going to fight like hell. And I completely overcame the despondency. So that's the power of negative visualization. I've used it all the time. And quickly, the other one is uh, kind of choosing discomfort, voluntary discomfort. So mm. you take on something you hate, you fear, and you drive yourself to just do it. And you find, of course, like most humans, when you do something you hate and you run to the fire, take it on willingly, you overcome it. And then you look back and you wonder why you feared it. So they're just two examples of tools of stoicism that build your titanium skin, if you will. Yeah, it's exactly how we uh, treat obsessive compulsive disorder, interestingly, which is with uh, graduated exposure to things that seem horrific and uh, intolerable and overwhelming. And then guess what? That's how people develop flexibility and regulation, which is the opposite of a safe place which is the opposite of being offended by everything, which is the opposite of how we're raising young people. How do we expect them to be healthy if we're doing the opposite of what we know they need to be emotionally healthy? Yeah, but you see, that is the method of the globalist madness. They understand all of this. Unfortunately, if we understand it, it helps us hugely in this battle. But unfortunately, they do understand it. I mean, they've got shrinks up the wazoo. They've looked at Stalin, Hitler, all the others over the years. It's always the same ploy. So they weaken society knowingly, and then it makes it easier for, the, for them to get their world government. And it's, it's obvious to us, but to most ordinary people, it feels like a conspiracy theory. But all they're doing is very artfully, cleverly, and with huge money, and networking across the world with their organizations like Trilateral Commission, WEF, Club of Rome. You could go on all day. They're simply deploying good herd psychology. And uh, they mm -hmm. did pretty well in Cerveza. And now I think they have headwinds. I think it's all to play for. A lot of ordinary people are beginning to wake up. So I think now it's on the razor's edge. It's the most exciting time. It's the fork turning like no other, because we've got technology in the mix. They believe that technology will allow them to get the thousand-year Reich that Adolf didn't manage to. That technology will allow them to really hold the line in their totalitarian regime. But I think technology is really helping us too. And that's why there's a rush for hate speech laws, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. So they are racing to head us off of the path. But we're also racing with growing awareness, which is making them uncomfortable. So, I mean, it is exciting to be alive. Home what may. And so that that's how you maintain that positive attitude. And I, and I also heard you... Tell Neil Oliver that uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Gumption in particular, was uh, an important yeah. part of this, which I think anybody can see that on you. I think the fact that you brought up globalist madness is the cue to bring George in. So let's bring George in. I'll give you a little again about George Gammon, entrepreneur, real estate investor. 
is show on YouTube, George, uh, YouTube slash uh, George Gammon, and on X, George Gammon. Let's get see if we can get George in here with the two of us. George, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So the globalist think, madness is what uh, the rebel rebel capitalist is talking about. Uh, I, I'm reading your T-shirt, Ivor, and, and um, he, 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 you know this is an interesting time to be having this conversation because uh, in this country it seems like the assault has been on the Constitution and the, and the First Amendment. That seems to be how the people want to wrestle back control from the likes of an Ivor. I mean, the things, I'm just guessing that the headlines you've seen in the New York Times have been like something at macabre, something out of a, of a, of a movie that you wouldn't actually believe. You, you'd feel the writer had overreached. You know, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. First Amendment is out of control. What are your thoughts? Well, it really goes back to what you guys were saying about free speech. In fact, we were talking about this. I was with uh, RFK and Robert Kiyosaki and uh, Kenny McElroy this weekend, and we were discussing how Marxism has infiltrated the educational system. And um, I said, I'm actually rather optimistic about that, because if we can uphold free speech, then I think the power is on our side, because very few kids nowadays are actually getting their education from their teachers. I think the majority of kids, especially young males, mm -hmm are getting what they learn from YouTube. And so as this long, a, and I think yeah. that's why you're seeing that, that's why you're seeing them attack free speech and misinformation and disinformation to the degree to which they're attacking it because they know that that's our greatest asset. You know, it's interesting when you look at like, what are the two major, three major stories of the last four or five years would be COVID, Hunter Biden's laptop and Russian collusion. Those are the three headlines that consumed people for months at a time. And the press in particular got all three completely wrong, completely wrong. And yet there is absolutely no uh, acknowledgement on their part. Here are all those crazy headlines, the New York Times. Is it sacred and is it also dangerous? In any event, the, the point is, do you want to give those people control? And the government has been in collusion, of course, with the press. We're now coming to understand. I, I've worked, as somebody looking at this from Dublin, is it the same in the EU? It's exactly the same. In America, it's more a pitched battle because you've got these two sides um, almost in a civil war scenario. In Europe, it's more a majority just goes with the flow with the European citizen mm. nonsense. Uh, but in Ireland, Ireland is a test case. It's a prototype, as I've often said, long before COVID, I said Ireland was a vassal state of the pharmaceutical industry. 60% of our GDP is biotech and pharma. And I thought it was just classic pharma corruption. But since COVID, it's clear they are absolutely up to their neck in the UN and the EU and the future totalitarian structure. So Ireland is just completely nuts. We are awash with economic migrants. 76% in an official uh, mainstream poll said that biggest concern was the government and mass economic migration. Clear as day. And the government since that nearly a year ago have utterly ignored it and they are flooding bigger numbers every month. So similar to America, nothing will stop them well, until we get the people rising, because the puppeticians, as I call them, they all report straight up to the big hand above. And the ones who come in who are naive and they get in and they think they're going to report to their constituents and be honest, uh, they find out very quickly they're gone unless they report to the big hand. And it's not a conspiracy theory. We, we see it every day. In fact, I often tell people, our noses are being rubbed in our own feces. And then you still have these idiots saying, oh, it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Even as the nose is being rubbed right in, it's up the nostrils. It's astonishing how stupid people are. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, but I, I think, think the it big hand would be... What's the big hand? Yeah, I think it would... I think it would help, Ivor, if we discussed 
the motivations behind the global elite because we talk about it we talk Please. about what they're doing and for a lot of people the average joe and jane it does seem like a conspiracy theory but what you have to do is you have to go back to the 1800s and once you understand their motivation and you look at today's events through that lens it all starts to make sense so you and i both know that pretty much what drives them stems back to a guy named thomas malthus so this is this idea this Malthusian idea that there's too many people and there aren't enough resources. So what we need to do is we need to reduce the population so we have more of an equilibrium. And Thomas, Thomas Malthus back in the 1800s argued why war, disease, famine was actually positive because, again, it would bring back this equilibrium to the world, people relative to resources. Forces. So every single thing that you see them pushing, whether it's this trans agenda, whether it's uh, the lockdowns, just it, it, every single thing they push equals lower population. And then the other thing that they push, the other part of their belief system is Marxism. This is why I always call them the Malthusian Marxist cult. And in Marxism, they have something called late stage capitalism. So currently, we have this huge homeless problem. We have this drug problem. I'm in at a hotel in Tucson right now, and you can see it everywhere around. And the problem is that in the school system, they're teaching young people that the, this bifurcation in the economy and this wealth gap, this inequality, and this drug problem, this homeless problem is a result of capitalism itself. And therefore, we need to break down the entire system because of the system that was built by straight white males. And then we need to rebuild it from the ground up but we have to destroy everything in the process and we have to take over the means of production from the capitalists and then we have to distribute it to the socialists and this is and if you look at all the policies that are being pushed right now by these global elite the club of rome the world economic forum they all fit right in line with malthusianism and with marxism that's what we're up against yeah Absolutely, so, George. So, and you know, the irony, the irony is that the guys driving it, in a sense, truly are capitalists. They are amassing capital, though it's not from their own labor and it's not from their talent. Like all the Rockefeller brothers who essentially set up the UN, donated the buildings and the land in New York and viewed it as their private club actually came across at one point many decades ago. But they created all these organizations. But remember the Rockefeller brothers inherited all the money and the Malthusian uh, profound ideology from John D. Rockefeller, who was kind of a sociopath. And then his father was a literal snake oil salesman and he had to run away from coast to coast when he raped or was accused of raping uh, a housemaid. I mean, this is the lineage. So they've adopted the Malthusian beliefs they feel elite um, and, and they really are the worst people on the planet in a sense, but this is what we have. Yeah, so, Dr. Drew, so for your Malthus, audience, I'd strongly encourage... Go ahead, oh, go ahead. George, go ahead. Oh, I would strongly encourage your audience to check out a YouTube video that I use on a lot of my videos that uh, goes back to this paper that came out by the Club of Rome in 1972 called The Limits to Growth. And, uh, you know, back then, this was a huge, huge topic. And I think MIT did a study, they used their computers, and they determined that on the current trajectory, that the world would basically come to an end in 2020. And you can see videos uh, yeah. in black and white, yeah. you know, talk, talking on YouTube uh, back in the 70s, talking about the limits to growth. And when Klaus Schwab started the World Economic Forum in 1971, in 72, he invited as a keynote speaker, the gentleman from the Club of Rome that wrote that paper, the limits to growth. And this was the foundation of today's global elite. So again, you've got to look at it through that lens to understand why these corporations are pushing a trans agenda. You know, why these corporations are going in, in lockstep with everything that these crazy governments are coming out and saying. It's because together they, they, they buy into this Malthusian um, worldview and this is the direction. They just think we have too many people and not enough resources. I mean, you just ask Bill Gates. I mean, he'll tell you. 
So, so Malthus, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting you refer back to the 70s because I was there. I was part of the ecology movement is what you're talking about. Uh, remember that ecology flag, which is sort of green stripes with a weird sort of quasi-infinity sign in it or, or phi in the middle. It, it, it was nuttiness on nuttiness, and I was completely indoctrinated into all that. We were predicting at the time, Malthus, look, Malthus is from whom Darwin sprung, right? It, it was Malthusian principles that led Darwin to conclude that, oh, Fan, uh, biological systems has to adapt to these limited resources or they die. That's the, that's sort of the Malthusian principle. And um, I was deep in it. Uh, I was uh, advocating. We, we had several things we were saying at the time. A, ice age, ice age coming, number one. Uh, number two, uh, acid rain was going to kill us in the north, particularly in the northeast and New England. You remember the acid rain? Acid rain was going to yeah. eliminate farming in the United States. Uh, number three, all the rivers and lakes. Oh, there's more. All the rivers and, and lakes were going to be choked, so-called choked, by algae blooms from the phosphate runoffs from the farms and, and the and the uh, and, and the, uh, the detergents we were using. Uh, number four, uh, run out of oil. Twenty years max. Twenty years max for oil. Uh, and and massive famine, massive famine, worldwide famine. It is coming. Start you know, canning your foods. It is coming. So that I was a thousand percent into that. Uh, and little did I know that something called bio biotech uh, and tech generally would guess what solve the problems of acid rain and famine and the phosphates. And repeatedly, multiple generations now. Malthusian principles have been outwitted by essentially Darwinian adaptation by the human population. Science. We we can we can outwit the Malthusian sort of uh, mathematics. It's clear. What, and it, here's the part that's astonishing to me: that the shitty ideas we had in the '70s didn't get buried in that horrible decade where they belong. <laughs> How did they end up having a life again in this decade? It's beyond astonishing to me. Not only are the shitty ideas coming back, but the <laughs> shitty styles and the shitty music are coming back. It's it's beyond imagination to me that we would revisit the worst decade, certainly in the history of American history. What is wrong with us? Is it because these these bureaucratic systems got so ensconced back then that we can't find our we hadn't found our way out, or or? Do these ideas uh, merely appeal to Marxists? I, what, what's going on? What is this? I think the ideas appeal to people who are anti-human. And that's at the core of, of this worldview. And Dr. Drew, you were talking about how ingenuity, human ingenuity solved these problems. The way I would say it is free market capitalism solved those problems. 100%. And ironically, 100%. that's exactly what they're attacking right now through this push yeah. towards Marxism and to bring down society because their view that we're in this game of, of late stage capitalism. So they're trying to tear down ironically what has solved the issues that they presented back in the 1970s. And that's why this is so perverse. And that's why we need to stand up and protect free speech. Because if people like you and Ivor are able to say these things out loud, if we're able to educate the population, the general public, as to how bad these ideas are, then we will win. But if, we, if we're banned, if we're you know, thrown into a corner of misinformation and disinformation, and we can't uh, expose these bad ideas to sunlight, then we're going to have some problems on our hands. All right, so I want to take a little break, and then that's where I want to focus our conversation because I really feel like the the battle lines have to be drawn around speech. I mean that that is that is it. That's where the that's where the stand must happen. Uh, it's the only thing I'm clear about that that free speech must be protected at all costs. That, that I just I can't I can't get past that, uh, and so it's clear to me that's what we all have to be doing right now. Uh, I have to take a little break. Before I do, uh, Ivor, I didn't know what a stoicist you were. Are, are you familiar with Ryan Holiday? Um, I don't think so, actually. You you ought to you ought to read at least one of his books, and you ought to find him online. So he's, he's 
He's a young man who uh, has been really deep in stoicism his entire career and has been bringing it to the masses. His um, his favorite is Marcus Aurelius, of course. But he um, he got into it. He got into it uh, years ago. I I ran into him when he was a college student. I didn't know who he was. He asked me what I was reading, and I said, "You you don't want to know." I, I he goes, oh, "I just want to know what you're reading," and I was like, "Well." I read broadly and weirdly, but right now I'm reading this thing called the Enchiridion by this guy named, um, oh shit, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, one of the very, very first uh, Stoics, Enchiridion. I'll talk it up to the break. Epictetus, Epictetus, yes, by Epictetus. And he was like, oh, I'm going to go read that. I'm gonna, okay, don't, not for the faint of heart. It's not, even, it's not even a complete document. It's just a bunch of pieces of his lectures. And... Um, that sent him on the road to a career studying and, and advocating for Stoicism. He's really, he thinks, and it's interesting, Stoicism comes on with popularity of certain periods of history where, where it's needed, frankly. Uh, and I think uh, we are into one of those periods for, for sure. Uh, we'll take a little break here. I'm here with George Gammon and Ivor Cummins. They very kindly have joined me. Ivor brought, came back, I appreciate, and he... Um, also is in uh, Irish time frame, so he's staying up late for us. And um, thumbs up for the Dr. Crew I'm seeing on the on Rumble Rants. Let me just get over to the restream. They appreciate you guys. Uh, don't show you. Uh, uh, yeah, my the audience seems to be on uh, along with us this time. So if there's any people that want to take on or question, please do put it in the rants. I'll read it during the break here. Be right back with George Gammon and uh, Avro Cummins after this. Of course, I'm a fan of the healthy aging supplement, True Niagen. I've been taking it almost for a decade myself. This supplement boosts NAD, which your cells need to survive properly metabolically, and it goes down as, as we age. It does so with a nutrient called nicotinamide riboside, or NR, specifically patented form of NR called Niagen. It's the most efficient and trusted NAD booster. NAD can also play a role in reproductive health. Boosting NAD is recommended with prenatal vitamins for women over 30 looking to start a family. Here's Dr. Amy, also known as the egg whisperer, a highly influential specialist in this area. That was when I said, this is amazing. I need every single person going through fertility to take it. I not only take it myself, my patients have shared stories, they took it and then they got pregnant naturally. And that's really my goal is I want people to empower themselves with the tools so that they can get pregnant without my help. True Niagen is an amazing NAD booster. You're going to want to add it to your reproductive health arsenal. And of course, it's in our family of Dr. Drew sponsors. Go to drdrew.com slash true for 20% off your order. That is drdrew.com slash true niagen. Enter Dr. Drew at checkout for 20% off. I'm excited to bring you a new product, a new supplement, Fatty. I take it. I make Susan take it. Take my whole family takes it. This comes out of, believe it or not, dolphin research. The Navy maintains a fleet of dolphins. And a brilliant veterinarian recognized that these dolphins sometimes developed a syndrome identical to our Alzheimer's disease. Those dolphins were deficient in a particular fatty acid. She replaced the fatty acid and they didn't get the Alzheimer's. Humans have the same issue. And we are more deficient in this particular fatty acid than ever before. And a simple replacement of this fatty acid called C15 will help us prevent these syndromes. It's published in a recent journal called Metabolites. It's a new nutritional C15, pentadecanoic acid, it's called. The deficiency that we are developing for C15 creates something called the cellular fragility syndrome. This is the first nutritional deficiency syndrome to be discovered in 75 years and may be affecting us in many ways, and as many as one in three of us. This is an important breakthrough Take advantage of it. Go to fatty15.com slash Dr. Drew to receive 15% off a 90-day starter kit subscription or use code Dr. Drew at checkout for that 15% off or just go to our website, drdrew.com slash fatty15. Many of us have not gotten over COVID. I'm not talking about the virus itself, but the response. We were flabbergasted about what the government could do to us. There is no telling what they might pull next time. And it's looking more like there will be a next time. So we all have to be what I call rationally ready. That's where the wellness company comes in. 
TWC is about access, access to physicians via telehealth, access to potentially life-saving medication. Years ago, having access to medication and telehealth might have seemed crazy, but now it seems crazy not to. Now, with claims that gain-of-function research have been done in the bird flu, I urge everyone to take control of their health care with the help of the wellness company. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off all their products, including the four medical kits, each of which has a different purpose. And we've added Tamiflu to one of them in case the bird flu does become a problem for humans. Be rationally ready. drdrew.com slash TWC for 10% off. And that's just trouble in a relationship. Sean, who are you? Like Dr. Drew all of a sudden? And there's evidence they've been monkeying with the monkeypox uh, virus as well. And so uh, go to TWC. We have suggestions there to keep yourself safe. Rashly ready is our thing. Also, our friends at Cozy Earth, they are dedicated to turning your home into a personal sanctuary. Their best-selling bamboo sheet set made from 100% premium viscous from bamboo. Soft, breathable. You will sleep several degrees cooler. It just stays right with you. Stretch knit pajama set has thick elastic waistband and functional pockets. And their new puffy sheep slipper is made with ultra soft sheep fur that wraps your feet in luxurious warmth. All of their bedding and bath products come with a 100 night sleep trial and a 10 year warranty. But once you experience the comfort of Cozy Earth, you will not want to go back. And you certainly will not give anything back. Wrap yourself in luxury this fall with Cozy Earth. Go to CozyEarth.com slash Drew and use the code Drew, not Dr. Drew, just Drew, for an exclusive discount up to 40% off. And in their post purchase survey, is you sell them, you heard about Cozy Earth from us here. Again, that is C-O-Z-Y-E-A-R-T-H, CozyEarth.com slash D-R-E-W. I got to get some of those slippers. I know you do. I'm for sure that you do. That sounds really good. You wanted to say something about capsidin? Oh, yeah. I always put my capsidin on mm. at the beginning of the show, mm. and it takes care of the pain in my, my carpal tunnel and the, my arms. But I put it on a little bee bite. I got bit by a bee last night by a meat-eating bee, mm -hmm. and it was kind of itchy, and I put it on there, and it helped. It is Thank good, you, it's good for It's good for neuro inflammation. For pain and pain, really. It's a pain. It's an, it's an analgesic, and it's very it's benign. Ivor Cummins, a biochemical engineer. Uh, Eat Rich, Live Long is his book. Follow him at Fat Emperor. And George Gammon, entrepreneur, real estate investor. You follow him on YouTube at George Gammon, also on X at, at George Gammon. Uh, Ivor, tell me again, why Fat Emperor? Or I forget. Oh, really briefly, I discovered in a few weeks of research 12 years ago, had a few bad blood tests, discovered all the stuff about cholesterol and fat being bad was utter nonsense. Oh, right. Yes, so yes. It, it was yes. The, the biggest scam ever. Well, until 2020, obviously. And um, mm. it just occurred to me one night having a few wines with my wife, this triple layer metaphor. I mean, you had the kind of the emperor's new clothes story from Christian Anderson mm -hmm. about a, mm -hmm. I knew the researchers, a lot of them knew that cholesterol was not a problem and fat was not a problem, but they had to keep their mouth shut. So there's an element of that story. And then there was the emperor for me signified corporate power that kept the nonsense alive. And then the poor fat kind of guy who's got diabetes, who's been told to eat more healthy whole grains. Mm. Uh, very sad. So it's kind of a mixture. And I just made that up and it stuck. Before we get back over to free speech, um, the I, I want to ask George about Elon Musk and and what you know what would life be like or how bad would things be if we didn't have him around? And he's, of course, under attack of late. And I heard you talk to Neil Oliver about persistent humans. I don't know if you guys have read, I'll ask Ivor first, his biography. But th that, is, uh, that is his superpower. That dude is relentless. You said something about persistent humans uh, when you were talking to, it was in your sort of gumption talk with Neil, Neil Oliver. Uh, and you were saying that persistence oh. was kind of a superpower. And, and I thought, yeah, for sure. Uh, when it, it's when you you went on into stoicism from there, but 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 I I thought of Elon immediately because if you read his biography, my God, is he is he relentless? He's just relentless. And now we have him protecting George, our free speech. Uh, what do we need to to protect him? And what would life be like if we don't? Well, it's not just Elon Musk. I think there are a lot of people that would fall into the category of uh, uh, people who realize the uh, 
um, necessity to maintain our free speech that have a large audience and have quite a bit of influence. I mean, Dr. Drew, you would fall into that category as well. I mean, um, Joe Rogan is the first that comes to mind because my mm -hmm. YouTube channel, the Rebel Capitals channel, got kicked off of YouTube in 2021 and no strikes, no warnings. Uh, it's just YouTube sent me an email saying, oh, yeah, by the way, we just took your channel down. And uh, I went ahead and retweeted that. I retweeted the email they sent. And uh, that kind of went viral within the macro space with the guys that I know. And then about four hours later, Joe Rogan picked it up and retweeted it and saying, you know, come on, uh, YouTube, this is ridiculous. You know, George talks about macroeconomics and, uh, you know, kind of the ramifications of the lockdowns here. Mm -hmm. And about a half hour after Joe Rogan retweeted that, I got an email from YouTube saying, whoops, sorry, it was our mistake, uh, human error. Uh, we went ahead and reinstated your channel. So it's, that's another thing to be really optimistic about is we have people that have, uh, you know, really smart guys uh, that are wildly ambitious and extremely competent that have a lot of influence that have large audiences and they understand the value and they're proponents of free speech. So as long as uh, these people are able to survive the attacks of the, I call them the central planners and the authoritarians, I think that we're going to come out uh, on the, the right side of, not just the right side of history, but I think we're going to come out as uh, winning this battle of ideas. But it just goes back to, and quite frankly, I think more and more people are going to have that type of influence because younger generations are going to gravitate towards social media to get their quote unquote education as opposed to the school system like we were talking about earlier. But it just reemphasizes the need to make sure that we give everyone a, a voice and that we have these platforms that are doing the best that they can to promote the ideas of free speech. And I think RFK Jr. said it really well this weekend. I, I was fortunate to be there live and listen to him speak. And he said the definition of free speech is not free. It's not speech that you like. It's actually the opposite of that. Uh, the free speech and free speech laws, it's actually allowing people to speak that you despise. And he gave the example of the ACLU. And Dr. Drew, you might have some insights because I think this happened when I was a lot younger. When the ACLU actually uh, stood up for the rights of the KKK to march yeah. in the South, yeah. uh, and everyone knew that this was detestable. This was grotesque. But they said that it's our yeah. job to stand up at, for their right to say whatever it is that they're going to say, no matter how much yep. we oppose it. And somehow we've gone from that to just silencing everyone that has a view that's slightly counter to the mainstream media. As I recall, I do remember that vividly. As I recall, they also defended a Nazi organization too. And this yeah. that one got a little more weird and contentious. But but that's what they were willing to do. Are are either of you forgiving of uh, Mark Zuckerberg? I, I won't show my cards yet. He's written a letter to Congress where he, uh, Ivor, I'd say no, judging by that grin, but you go ahead. He wrote a letter to Congress where he was sort of falling on his sword, admitting some guilt, talking about the excessive censorship and outreach of the Biden administration. Yeah, well, I mean, he's just hedging. He's just playing the game. So that's fair enough. I don't really judge him for that. I mean, I, I'll have to stay true to my philosophy. I mean, stoicism, you know, that's one of the virtues is forgiveness and just mm -hmm. good judgment and that they're not always driven by evil per se. And I often give the trivial mm -hmm. example, just the easy example in my talks. Like I just did three big talks in the UK, packed rooms, it was great fun. Uh, public shows, but I make the point about the people who wear masks. I mean, you are screaming within yourself to ridicule them. It's almost irresistible. And you're so angry with them because, as I mentioned earlier, by wearing the slave cloth, they perpetuated the madness. So genuine anger. But you have to just say, look, most of them are not evil people. They were indoctrinated. They were hypnotized in a mass formation. Most of them actually believe mm -hmm. it. It's not really their fault. But Zuckerberg, it's hard to extend that kind of charity. 
he knows all the stuff that's going on, right? You have to assume. So he's just playing the game, I guess. Yeah, I think I, on I net balance feel it's a good like, thing, though. I, go ahead, George. Oh, I think on net balance it's a good thing, regardless of his intentions, because it mm. shows and it right. exposes the government exactly what they're doing for the average Joe and Jane right. to see. Right. I think I think we ha using using the Stoic principles uh, that Ivor you advocate. We have to stay focused on what our goal is, which is to make sure this does not happen again and that speech is protected and all allies are welcome. <laughs> you know, I, and I think, yes. I think uh, the, model, the model of saying, I did something wrong, I he didn't really apologize, but I, I don't care what, if he's motivated to make money, he's motivated to be a good guy in the eyes of the men. I don't, I don't give a shit. He's like, they went too far. I shouldn't have done it. I'm not going to do it again. You're welcome here, my friend. You're welcome here. I, I don't, I don't like it. I don't dig it. But uh, all are welcome on this pirate ship we're trying to create to protect the basic principles of this, of certainly this country. Uh, and I assume, you know, we we come from, we we uh, are cut from Albion's cloth, as they say. And uh, George uh, Albion's uh, is the old name for the British Isles. And, uh, you know, is, is free speech as much of an issue in Ireland? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, they, they, they actually got away during the COVID nonsense because most people just complied. So there, were, there was less heavy hitting lunacy, like in France, Macron came in with the iron fist Mm -hmm. because the French were really resisting a lot of them. In Ireland, people mm -hmm. just rolled over. We've gotten very soft. I mean, I'm sad to say it, but cowardice is, is now a, a common trait, I'm afraid. But Ireland is rising mm -hmm. up, no question about it. And, you know, I think the awareness of people that something's rotten is now becoming established. Now, the main issue that got Ireland awake in the end was actually the mass migration because it went so over the top. We had a massive homeless problem. We had a problem with housing. It was a huge issue the government was not addressing. So we already had that. And then because the UN basically told them or cracked the whip, they started flooding us with migrants, like the graphs have gone off the scale. And now people are getting really angry because literally they are taking nursing homes or intended nursing home facilities and converting them to places for, and get this, this is the reality, young male migrants. So 85 to 90% of the migrants are absolutely not from any country that has a war or any problem with asylum. That's like nearly 50% are Nigerian and Pakistani. That's nearly half of the migrants for the last year. And clearly there is nothing going on there. So people are beginning to realize, hold on a minute, for some reason, I don't want to get into conspiracy theory. For some reason, our puppeticians are hell bent on going against our wishes and they are causing havoc in our villages and towns and exacerbating an already extremely difficult situation with housing and homeless. So this is forcing them to wake up. But hate speech law, the government, I just did a video two hours ago on it. The government said yesterday they're going to make a third attempt to ram through the hate speech law. And we won't get into the wording here, but it's 1984 Minority Report all packaged together in parentheses and squared. So the wording is but insane. You guys brought up uh, Marxism at the beginning. Isn't this the goal? Is to yeah. flood yeah. and the, yeah flood the flood the population yeah. so you don't have a national identity, but but really so you also even don't have a cultural identity. I, I was listening to some lectures in France, some history lectures a couple of years ago, and they started looking at, at historical figures that they had historically condemned. And they went, you know, they after all are part of us and who we are and what is to be French. And I thought, oh, they're, they're trying to decide what does it even mean to be French. And that's going to that's gonna create, well, I, I saw it coming, Marie Le Pen. And that's sort of happening all around Europe. George, we don't really have that problem. 
We, this country, we look at it as economic difficulty, putting the finger on the scale of voting, uh, you know, it's expensive and taking money away from people that are Americans that do need the money. It's a little different. Do you agree? Uh, I think we have the same problem. I mean, I've got a lot. And, and what you're talking about is the Marxist wants to break down the fabric of society. They, they want to tear everything down. So they sit back and say, well, how can we best achieve this? So as an example, I've got a lot of employees that work for me that live in Colombia that are from Venezuela. And they fled the Venezuelan hyperinflation. They've got a lot of family there. And they said that now Caracas is one of the safest cities in the world. Well, why is that? Because they took all their gang members and they shipped them to the United States. Because they could just go through the Darien Gap and they could just come across the border and they'd get a, a debit card for $10,000. Now you see all these gangs, Venezuelan gangs, that are taking over all these apartment buildings in Denver and doing this all over the United States, not to mention the problem that we're having in New York City. So it's just, um, again, when you look at the immigration crisis, we'll call it, the illegal immigration crisis, through the lens of a Marxist, it all makes sense. And I think this is, um, without a doubt, intentional. But the one thing that we have, another thing I'll say that we have uh, as an uh, advantage or a tool in our toolkit is the fact of they, they have hubris, Dr. Drew, uh, from the standpoint mm. of they overreach all the time. And what this does inadvertently is it makes people that otherwise would have been sympathetic to their arguments, it makes them open up their eyes. So as an example, you remember back during uh, COVID, how they kept pushing these vaccine mandates and everyone has to get the vaccine and people were going along with it until they said, well, now we want to force your three-year-old to get the vaccine. And that's when people, even on the left or even people that were extremely pro-vaccine said, whoa, 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 time out. You can force me to get this, but you're not putting it in my kid until we find out exactly what's going on. And then those people start to say, well, wait a minute, they've been lying to me about this. What else have they been lying to me about? And then they start to look at, uh, you know, you were talking earlier about all of the things that have been labeled misinformation and disinformation. I always say today's disinformation is tomorrow's truth. And we've seen that over and over and over again, especially since 2020, I mean, more recently with the Nord Stream pipeline. How the Wall Street Journal comes out and said, oh, yeah, this is just some a few drunk guys from Ukraine. When back when that happened, <laughs> they were blaming everything on Russia, everything on Russia. And if you said otherwise, well, then you were spreading misinformation and disinformation, just like they were saying back during COVID. But that's just a small example. And I, this weekend, was with a good friend of mine at this Limitless um, event, and she was listening to RFK. And back during COVID, she was taking the whole thing hook, line, and sinker. Uh, she was your typical mm -hmm. liberal Democrat. I mean, she's great. I've been friends with her forever. But, but this whole vaccine, actually, she didn't go the path of the vaccine because even she was skeptical about that. But masks and lockdowns and everything else. And she told me this weekend, she says, you know what? They have been proven wrong, the mainstream media, so many times that now I don't mm -hmm. believe anything that is coming out of their mouth. And I assume that anything so that good. they label misinformation is actually something that I should be paying attention to because that's actually truth. And she kind of uses whatever they're labeling as disinformation as kind of smoke, uh, you know, wh where there's fire and to do more research on that. And she comes to more yep. and more of the, you know, when she does her own research, she uh, concludes that the mainstream media is just pushing propaganda. So now she is completely, it's totally opened up her eyes. And I think that's a huge advantage that we have, the, the hubris of the global elite. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, elites tend to be hubristic. And uh, that's what generated this show. I started interviewing people that have been canceled, but particularly physicians and, and scientists. And guess what? I may not have agreed with everything they said, but I learned something from every one of them. And some of them I learned a lot from. And uh, some of them I have huge admiration for now, and they turned out to be completely right at all times. So yeah, your, your point is well taken. And, and I just want to uh, bring out a little quick story about this sort of capitalism and, and tearing things down. Uh, interviewed a kid named Jared Klickstein. He wrote a book called Crooked Smile. Where he was a heroin addict on the streets. And he told me that uh, what really, a couple things, what really made his disease dangerous and made him a criminal was when in California, 
they changed the law so you could steal you know, $800 a day, $900 a day to support your habit, which he did on a regular basis, number one. And then number two, he said he could also, eventually they started giving drugs out. The, the state started giving drugs out, the city, the county, handing drugs out. And he said almost to a person, these people that were there in the streets to help him with his homelessness and his addiction would pat him on the back and say, you're a victim of capitalism. Once we bring down capitalism, we, yeah. you'll be you'll be fine. It's un that is murder. That is murder, guys. That is somebody committing manslaughter, and they should be prosecuted accordingly. Uh, and that is disgusting, George. Yeah, that's what you have to understand. Because to the rational human, we see these zombie apocalypse zones. And like I said, I'm in one right now in Tucson, where it's just it's it's a war zone where people are literally walking around with needles sticking out of their arm. And we, as rational people, say, okay, we've got to do it. We've got to have more rule of law. Uh, we have to have more free, we have to get the economy going. And in order to give these people an opportunity, we need to address mental health. We need to address all these things. But for the person that's brought, been brought up in the school system of where they push Marxism, they see it the complete opposite of that. They look at all of these, let's call it the zombie apocalypse, and they say this is a result of white straight males building society, building a capitalist society. And the only way to fix this problem is to redistribute the wealth. The only way to fix this problem is through socialism. And we know that that's going to exacerbate the problem. So uh, again, we can sit here and talk about how crazy this is, but I would suggest the audience try to do your very best to look at it through the lens of these people that to us seem crazy because to them, we seem crazy. And uh, to them, this is just, this makes sense. And this is evidence. Everything that we see around the world today and in the United States with let's just say uh, income inequality, they see that as confirming their views on, on, on Marxism. And so what do you expect? We predicted this. So uh, th this is really what we're uh, up against. And, but, you know, back to the topic of hubris, Dr. Drew, I'm sure you saw this the other day, how RFK came out and said, um, you know, he was not only battling big pharma, but he was battling big food and uh, these terrible uh, yep. foods that we have in the United States. And sure enough, within two or three days, time comes out with a story saying why ultra processed foods aren't that bad. Yeah. yeah. And that's an example of hubris because whether you're on the right or you're on the left, whether you're progressive, liberal, conservative, it doesn't matter. When you see a headline like that, you're like, what? No, that, that <laughs> now you're trying to convince me that ultra processed foods are somehow healthy. No, 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 this can't be right. And then that builds that, that skepticism. Yeah. So let's talk about solution. Um, Ivor, what, what do we do? What, what do we start? Uh, obviously, the battle lines can be drawn around free speech. We can all get up and talk about things like this, whether we agree with each other or not. Uh, that's my job. What else? Yeah, well, Dr. Drew, so free speech is just an imperative. Without that, as George elucidated, yeah, you take that plank out, we're all going to be running for the hills. Uh, that's fundamental. I always say it's a two-hander. It's awareness in the population. It's the only thing that ever, you know, overcame these types of turnings was the people rose. So awareness is huge. I know it's difficult. I know a lot of people are hypnotized. And as George absolutely correctly said, this mm -hmm. kind of 50% of people who have fallen for the Marxist nonsense, what's happening in the world, the worse it gets, just reaffirms their nonsense. So it's challenging, but awareness and raising awareness. And I always say to people, forget about chemtrails. I mean, I have people I respect who are asking me about chemtrails. I just say, shut up, mm. forget about chemtrails, mm. forget about flat earth stuff, forget about anything that may be true, but it sounds conspiracy-ish. You will never convert mm. new people with anything that smells a conspiracy. So focus on UN, WEF, Rockefeller. <gasps> Focus on the Agenda 2030. The uh, UN Pact for the Future is being signed in September. Do you know that? It's all documented. It basically says all of what they're doing. 
to us. So focus on the really published solid as a rock stuff and concepts like Malthusianism and history, the real stuff like we used to talk about 50 years ago. So that's one thing is awareness. And the other thing is to live, to live it. So use cash, local producers, eat real food, practice stoicism, get mentally strong, get mental acuity, get physical, metabolic and mental strength for the challenges ahead. And basically don't use their systems and oppose them at every turn. And then, of course, there's the broad one, network like hell, talk to people, meet in real life. That was actually my thing in the UK last week. The whole theme was we need to get away from the telegram groups, the kind of circle jerk, you know, getting paranoid and being terrified of every latest nonsense. Forget about it all. Meet in real groups, real community, grow communities in real life and start just growing this tribe who who is a tribe that's unified with one unifying purpose. It's against all the nonsense from the guys who are ruining the future for our children and grandchildren. Just keep that as the central theme. And um, yeah, you know, it's old fashioned, but but that's the way I see it. I, I and you're still smiling. I can't I can't get over your your positive mental attitude, but <laughs> But uh, but uh, the the I hear more about building community and and when you look at every I've said this many times on this stream, but when you look at every great uh, epic poem or story like Voltaire's Candide, at the very end, what you know whether it's Gilgamesh or uh, Homer and Odysseus or Candide, they at the end of the book they after their big adventures and going around the world and trying to save it, their ultimate conclusion is you should go back to your community and serve it. <laughs> uh, you know, Voltaire had, you should cultivate your garden. Gilgamesh said, I've got to be a good king. Omer went back and reestablished, I mean, Odysseus, his family. It, it's, it always comes to the same thing. George, do you agree with that? Is there more to be done? Well, I want to encourage people to realize that they have the power. And if they could take one thing away from this live stream, that's it. What I mean by they have the power is none of this is a foregone conclusion. And even if maybe 10% of the population of the United States or in Ireland were to just push back against this, they would be defeated. And when I say push back, all you have to do is just say no. Just say no. Yeah. And I always use the example of uh, COVID in 2020 in Phoenix is a city I know well. It's about 4 million people. And think about if uh, they implemented these lockdowns and said that you couldn't go to school, you couldn't open your business. What if just 10% of the population just said, no, no, I'm not doing that. 400,000 people just said, no, I'm going to teach kids. And yes, I'm going to take my kid to school and I'm going to open up my business. And I don't care about your stupid laws. I'm just going to continue to live my life. There is nothing the army, the military, the police, the local government, it's, there's nothing they could do. They would just sit back and say, well, I guess that's it. You know, another time right during COVID, uh, my research assistant, Josh, he was on a flight from Atlanta to Naples. And in Naples, there's a lot of freedom loving people, that's for sure. And this was the height of COVID where they were just adamant about wearing masks, of course, except when you're having a, a Jack and Coke because then COVID uh, takes a time out. But uh, Josh said right. that once they got up in the air, like half the flight just said, no, we're not wearing masks. And they, they literally took off the mask and the, the stewardesses were like, oh, you got to put that on your... They're freaking out. And then the, the captain is on the microphone saying, you got to put that on. You got to put that on. And they just said, yeah, no, no, I don't think so. And what are they going to do? And they just have to go down and, yeah. and land. And uh, I'd like to remind everyone the story of how Romania uh, got rid of communism back in the early uh, 1990s with Ceausescu, who was a, uh, a, a dictator, to say the least. He had the power of the police, the military, everything. And it was just boiled down to 500,000 people that, that uh, gathered at their square and just pushed back and said, no, absolutely not. And nine days later, they took him out back and shot him. 
And now I'm not condoning violence of any sort, but I'm just saying that to show people that at the end of the day, there's a lot more of us than there is of them. And if we just come together as a group of like-minded individuals that see the insanity and just push back and say, no, there's nothing they can do and we win. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you guys have mentioned, uh, go ahead, Ivor. Oh, and I was going to say, you, you'd be delighted, Dr. Drew, that I'm still on form. When, when George had the brought him out and shot him, I laughed. Um, so, but, but the thing is, some people deserve to be executed in a sense. I mean, without condoning violence, etc. He was a very, very evil man with, with blood dripping from his hands. And But I love that point. Yeah, 10%, 12% is a tipping point. And not only can nothing be done with the 10 or 12 percent, but then, of course, the sheep or the herd, the tribe, look at the 10 percent, see them kind of making sense, and then their fear reduces and they have a chance to jump ship. And then you get Mm, the tip. Right. So it's just huge. And in COVID, one guy on Twitter, I remember once I was railing about masks, probably telling the story about how their master stroke in the summer of 2020 when the hospitals were emptied and there was no ICU porn. They had nothing. The masks got them to the next winter. And one guy replied and says, well, Ivor, more than that in a sense, if they hadn't brought in the masks, the whole thing would have collapsed. And I Mm -hmm. realized in Western Europe, if they hadn't brought in the masks, four months would have passed. People would have moved on. And I don't think mm-hmm. they, it's true. They couldn't have ranked, racked up the fear porn in October, November. It just wouldn't have held. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've heard, heard you that mean float that the, theory. Go mm-hmm. ahead, George. Oh, I'm sorry. Ivor, I don't know if you, or if you guys or Dr. Drew, you've seen the meme, but I'd strongly suggest the audience kind of look it up. I think it's floating out there on Twitter where it starts off with a, a crowd of people, let's just say 30 or so, that are bowing down mm-hmm. to one guy at the front, a, a dictator, an authoritarian that's cracking the whip. And then the next stage, you've got one person in the crowd that stands up. And then the guy you know, goes to crack the whip even harder, but he continues to stand. And then the next stage, you've got half of the crowd standing up against the authoritarian. The last stage, you have the entire crowd standing up against the authoritarian and the authoritarian with the whip is now bending over on his knees. That's yeah. the way it works. That's it. I, I always thought that was the role of press to the, uh, to make sure that the populace went that direction, but it, it's, it's, it's gone on its head lately where they do the opposite, where they stand behind the there person with the whip there that we see on. There it is. Exactly. And so yeah, but yeah, but I, I think it's if, worth if, if reviewing. You're the press, though, Doctor Drew. You're the press. Forget CNN. Forget God, God MSNBC. God. I mean, you, well, Rogan. It, it's that, hard. That's why it, this free speech it, thing is it, so important. You are the press. It is why it's so important. I agree with you. But but when you realize you're up against CBS, NBC, ABC, New York Times, MSNBC, you know, you know, these are big, you know, influential organizations that. And people are they're losing, and people are, are are starting to see, as your friend did, that they can't believe anything, and the, they can't believe anything, and they don't know what's real. And uh, same thing in social media, by the way, you have to be very careful on what you believe and what you you know you have, to, you have to really look at things very very carefully. But it it's it is an ongoing battle. But it's also worth re- reviewing. You guys mentioned mass formation more than one time, and that's Matthias Desmet's idea. And it's worth looking at those numbers for a quick second, which is. What he found in the psychology of totalitarianism is that 20% of people become rapidly hypnotized. And my hypnosis friends tell me that is a universal feature of humanity. About 20% of the people are really easily hypnotized. About 10% can't be hypnotized. And they are the ones that throw the bullshit flag very early in these events. It's the 70% in the middle that just want to live their lives and be left alone that can't. They can't do that anymore. They have to, you have that 10% that's, that is standing up in the whipping analogy uh, needs to bring in that 70%. And, and that's the group that really is going to make the difference. They, they, they can no longer 
just put their head down and get along. We, they have to stand up for a minute, and, and we won't keep them very long. I promise. We just need their we just need their participation until some of this foolishness sort of until the wheel turns. To to use the analogy of the turning that you. Uh, that you mentioned, Ivor, early in this conversation. So do you see this as a fourth turning, Ivor? Yeah, I mean, it's a fourth turning, but I think it's a little supercharged in fairness. It's not the run-of-the-mill one because of technology. Sure, These are technocrats, tech. and they believe they'll use the technology to succeed where the totalitarians of the past did not. Or they'll create a prison, as Aldous Huxley said, a pr perfect prison where the inmates are not even really aware they're in prison. And that's what they're going for. Um, but, I mean, just to end on a positive sign, I mean, I loved this one the other day. Just before I gave the shows in the UK, it was just beautiful to add to the positive news. So in Ireland, very briefly, if a recent poll showed that 47% of the population had strong misgivings about the toxicity and side effects of the COVID-19 vaccines, that would be huge, actually. I, I, to George's point, yes. I mean, 47%, wow, I can work with that. But the poll actually wasn't for the people. It actually polled doctors and nurses in the medical system. Mm. And it was 47% mm -hmm. said that. Now, mm. the medical system during the COVID they were lost. They were the worst people in Ireland. I have I have someone in my family who was in college doing medicine. They said it was zombie apocalypse. You're literally screaming about passports and keeping out the unvaccinated. That kind of crew. Mm -hmm. And now 47% in a confidential poll say, yeah, they're concerned about side effects and severe potential harm from the COVID vaccines. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. Even those guys, utterly indoctrinated and lost, I thought, nearly half and, of them are kind and, of waking up. And need to really look at themselves because that's, that is the prison guard experiment. You would not, if you did that, particularly as a healthcare provider, you would, you would not be the good guy in a Nazi Germany scenario. You would be the prison guard. <laughs> George, your, your last thoughts. I would encourage the audience to just ask themselves when the last time the people that were in favor of censorship were the good guys. Right. And uh, if you go back throughout history, I, I can't find a time when they were the good guys. Oh. So if you're on the fence about this, just realize that, uh, you know, if you want to be on the right side of history, you've got to promote free speech and these ideas, no matter how quote unquote dangerous they are, because at the end of the day, that that's our best weapon. Um, and that's really all we've got. So that's how I kind of break things down into very, very simple terms. So just at any of the stuff that's going on right now, you know, any of the things that these people are pushing, you know, ask yourself, did the Nazis do that? Did Stalin do that? Did, uh, you know, did the patriots that started the United States, did they, and you start to see that, well, wait a minute, even though I might think that this, uh, you know, sensory of misinformation is a good thing, I realize that going back throughout history, that's never, ever, ever been a good idea. And it's always led to totalitarianism and authoritarianism. So that's what I would encourage people to think and, through their uh, own defense. And, and one, uh, one very Ivor, you were last telling thing. about a half, go ahead. Oh, just one last thing, and George, you just reminded me there. Nick Hudson of Pandata in South Africa, an amazing man, amazing intellect. He came out with a short clip that I alone got nearly 3 million views on Twitter. It's gone everywhere, and it's a simple heuristic. Mm. He said, if you are told there is a global issue that affects all of us, and only a global authority can resolve it for us, and... That will involve, and it does involve, censorship and collusion and all the other stuff we see. Then you know it is a scam. And I don't think, like George said about the other one, there's no exception. No exception. Yeah, and... And same, you know, uh, same. It's, it's as goes capitalism goes government. The closer to the customer, the closer to the people, the government is. The better it is. The more efficacious it is. The 
less uh, arbitrary it is, the more it serves the actual needs of the people and the customer, if it's capitalism. Adam Smith had it pretty much right. Uh, and you did mention, uh, Ivor, a few minutes ago, something about uh, people being canceled through history. And I, I was just going to bring up back then that, you know, you you, you got to remember this has been going on since Galileo. And you got, do you want to be the Spanish Inquisition or do you want to be on Galileo's side? Uh, that which which is your which is your your poison? Which would you pick? And then finally, you mentioned the Patriots, George, in this country, uh, advocating for free speech. John Adams did bring us the Aliens and Seditions Act, and it was a ignom it was an ignominious and embarrassing chapter of our history that we always looked back upon with great uh, opprobrium. And now we think it's a. It seems to be. It seems like our leaders think it's a. Now it's a good idea. Something that we allowed put in place for a few years that was a, all, throughout history looked at as a giant mistake. Now all of a sudden it's a good idea. Okay, I guess I guess now we understand. Much like the seventies, we fig, whenever anybody says we finally figured things out, run. Uh, the, the 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 answers are. You know, it, we we can progress, we can move forward, but it, there's never an answer. It's never, it's never one thing. That's why I'm getting upset about people going. Uh, how do we're supposed to believe a? You know, you got to go believe a scientific authority. They're not they're not trusting science anymore. Science is a process. It's not a scientism. It's a process. Anyway, we could go on all day about this stuff. I got to wrap these things up. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, we'll follow George Gammon on X. We'll follow or Ivor Cummings on X at, at Fat Emperor. And uh, both of you, your YouTube channels, we'll send people there. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Likewise. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Dr. Good Drew. Guys. And let's go back, uh, Caleb, and take a look at the schedule coming up here. I think we have Salty Cracker coming up in a couple of days. Thursday. Thursday. And we ha that's going to be a noontime show, I believe. Before my show. Before Susan's Co. calling out. And then tomorrow we have Tom Wren's going to go review some new stuff with him. Uh, Susan is going to revisit the MH3. Tomorrow's, Tomorrow's my birthday. We're going to Susan's going to revisit the MH370 situation. MH370 and 911. Uh, with Rob Schneider Do coming with Captain in Don Hanley on the tenth. On, on the tenth, and Michael Gates comes back with us to talk about his struggles with the state of California. Uh, Joel Pollack. I haven't talked to him in a long time, and uh, Jimmy Dore. Mike Cathwood's coming back, old Loveline partner. He's going to be in studio with us. Marty Macquarie has been around quite a bit lately. We have Dr. Brian Hooker. Great guest coming up. Many more to come. We appreciate you being here. Uh, let me look quickly at the... I was going to say something. One thing. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Caleb. Oh, yes. Susan. I just wanted to, uh, for the audience who weren't familiar with the word you just used, here's the definition of opprobrium. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Just, he comes just up helping. with these words. Just helping. <laughs> it's a real word, guys. You know what's weird? <laughs> It's a real word, and I, and I thought it was spelled Harsh with an. I thought it was spelled with an A censure, until this minute. So <laughs> thank you for straight that. Me too. I it. You have to read it to the people who are listening oh, on the podcast. You're listening, opprobrium, harsh criticism, or censure, extreme dishonor, often with lasting consequences. Opprobrium was absolutely I'm surprised how surprised you could spell that. That's how good, Caleb. We came up with the how we have felt throughout American history about the Aliens and Sedition Act. Homeschooled, and he could which, spell it. Was our one, <laughs> which was our one big censorship uh, policy that we moved away from very quickly. Um, oh, a he super chat! Though, I want you to say. I want to say something. Casey sent a super chat. Uh, loving you and your content. Hi, I was Casey. taken off Twitter. Twenty two. Jesus, that's awful. Uh, salt must flow, Serene. Yes, he will. The salt will flow. It will. Can I say something? Yes, please. So they were talking about how you are like Joe Rogan, and you can get the message out, and you're mm. the new, you're the media. Mm. It's true. But what I what came to mind immediately was we were talking to a local newscaster who's been in television forever, mm -hmm. and you know you have your left uh, media that does like local news. You, you're not even allowed to be a good lighting person and have a Republican point of view over there. And then you have your right, which is, you know, like Fox. But it's like somehow we're right in the middle. And mm -hmm. that's such a, a refreshing thing because, you know, just watching like the Today Show in the morning drives me nuts, you mm -hmm. know, because it's just, it's just fluff. It doesn't, they're not saying anything. They're saying what the government has told them to say. Mm -hmm. And then the, the people on the right might be going a little too much to the right, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get pulled into that. I just have to admit that. But um, <laughs> I'm, you know, I try so hard to watch CNN these days, but it just, every time I just want to rip my eyelashes out. But um, 
if if he, you know what he was trying to say to you is that you have freedom of speech on your show, which yeah. is unusual for anybody working in television. Mm. Everything's pre-produced. Nothing is live. You have to just go with whatever your producer told you to do, mm. and you can't like. She was just saying she can't she she can't say what she wants to say, but she wouldn't well, even say true. it to me, I, you know. Yeah, but I think that's yeah, I, I I get it, and and most of the people that we have or that are friends in television are actual journalists and and wanted to get things right. But like but, news network news and stuff like that, like it's all you know, it's all it's business pre planned and business. it's just to get the message out without scaring everybody. Although they did a great job during COVID nineteen, but um. You know, but they also, I have to give them this, is the only time that they go radicalize is when it rains in California and they make everybody stay home and not drive their car. How they're able to do that, I have no idea. Well, well fortunately, it's not us. <laughs> so, okay, let's uh, wrap this up. We appreciate you being here. Tomorrow is uh, 3 o'clock. Powerful flowing golden stream, Molten Sod says. Molten oh, Sod. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you guys for uh, making me say that. Uh, let's see. I think that will do it for today and tomorrow. Um, we have Tom Renz come. We'll go over some of his data and see what's new on his, uh, radar. And then the salt will flow at noon on Thursday. See you then. Uh. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.